Okay, we are a few minutes after the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Tan, and I am a program coordinator at Workwell NYC. And we are very excited to welcome you all to today's workshop, Looking Back to Look Ahead, Celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander, or AAPI, Heritage Month. From 20 to 2020 to 2022, hate incidents increased over 300% for Asian diasporic people within the United States. This Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we recommit to dismantling the multiple oppressions that threaten the safety and undermine the freedoms and dreams of Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander communities. In today's interactive workshop, we will reflect on the history of the AAPI community in the U.S. and discuss ways to learn from the past. We will then brainstorm and celebrate ways to move forward as allies with a focus on creating safe and inclusive spaces. Next slide, please. So today's workshop is brought to you by Workwell NYC. Workwell NYC is the worksite wellness program for all City of New York employees, and we operate in five key program areas. We have Move More, which focuses on physical activity. We have Eat Well, which targets healthy eating and nutrition. We have Take Action, which focuses on primary care and prevention. We have Be Well, which focuses on mental well-being and resilience. And lastly, we have Project Build, which stands for Building Understanding, Inclusion, Learning, and Diversity, and that is our Health Equity Initiative. And so again, we are really excited for today's workshop. And so with that, I will turn it over to our speakers, Jen and Wayne. Great. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all so much for being here. It's great to be with you. My name is Jen Curry. She, her, I'm the CEO of Change Impact. We are a New York City certified MWBE. We're a partner to the city. We do um, quite a bit of professional development and capacity building work, and it's really my pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Um, and I'm just going to share a couple of opening remarks before I introduce um, our guest, Wayne, and really get into conversation. Um, as you heard from Anna, you know, in describing the session, we know that um, from 2020 to 22, we've seen this um, really unprecedented, historic, and um, just truly awful increase in hate incidents um, for um, people of Asian descent. And, you know, we don't, I've thought a lot about how to present this here because we don't want to be triggering. We don't want to um, dwell on that, but we have to acknowledge that this is happening, right? It's happening in our communities. And um, Anti-Defamation League has actually been tracking these types of incidents. And there were over 100 documented such incidents just in the first six months of 2020. Um, and, you know, we we titled this session very carefully, looking back to to look forward, um, because we know that we, we have a history, um, very unfortunately, of um, oppression among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and we'll we'll use that AAPI language today. Although we know that there are probably better terms and um, more more accurate terms, but we'll we'll use it um, in the context of today's conversation. You know, American history includes um, taxes that were only applied to Chinese people, um, uh, rules and laws that prohibited Asian people from marrying outside of their race, um, laws about immigration that. You know, effectively stopped immigration from Asia specifically for decades. Um, and you know we we have to acknowledge and be aware of this history. A lot of this history is not taught in our schools and we maybe learn it as as adults, maybe we're learning it today for the first time. So we have to acknowledge where we've been. Um, but we're really also very fortunate to be in a position where um, we're not just acknowledging where we've been, but we can look ahead to where we're going. And in our city, we have so many um, advocates and resources that are supporting the AAPI community um, and advocating for change. And I'm really, really delighted to introduce Wayne Ho, who is one of these leaders in our city that we're very lucky to have among us. Um, and Wayne, I won't read your whole bio because we would be here all day singing your praises, but I will just say that Wayne is the president and CEO of Chinese American Planning Council, which is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency. Um, Wayne previously worked at FPWA and the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. He is UC Berkeley and Harvard educated, um, and he is a public servant in our city um, with board service uh, with Coro New York and partnership for after school education. Um, and again, Wayne has done so many other things. We're so fortunate to have him here. 
uh, and he is probably the most popular person in New York City, at least over these these few weeks, um, certainly in May, but really year round. Um, and Wayne, we're just so delighted to have you here. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for the invitation, Jen. I'm glad to be here and to see everybody. Yeah. So we're actually, um, I don't know if, if folks are, you know, used to having sort of slides and a lot of structure. We're going to do this in sort of a more fun way today where I'll be in conversation with Wayne. Um, we have some questions that we're going to ask and some things that we're going to have you react to. And then we're really going to open it up for, for conversation. So the first thing that I would like to ask you to do is just, you know, tell us about yourself and sort of your involvement and leadership in the AAPI community from, you know, your personal experience to your professional experience. Sure. Uh, so thanks again for the invitation to be here. It's glad to speak with everyone. Uh, CPC, Chinese American Planning Council, we're the largest Asian American social services nonprofit in the country. Uh, we only serve New York City, so we serve 80,000 New Yorkers of all ages and backgrounds. And uh, we have the alphabet soup of city agencies that we contract with from DYCD and ACS and HRA to HPD, uh, I'm missing some of their DOE and other organizations or other city agencies. So we're a partner to carry out the mission of serving the most vulnerable in the city. On a personal note, um, I always like to start off these types of conversations and say, I'm Chinese, I'm an immigrant, I'm Asian American, I'm heterosexual, I'm a person of color, I'm man, um, cisgendered. Uh, and I think it's important for us to recognize these identities as we talk about then how do we promote more diversity, equity, and inclusion, while also acknowledging the history of communities and what's led us today. Uh, and I'm fortunate and privileged and humbled to lead this organization that's been around for 65 years that works not just with the Chinese American or AAPI community, but people of all backgrounds in order to help them not just survive, but thrive here in New York City. That's great. Thank you, Wayne. And you um, set me up perfectly for what I'm going to have us do next, because um, you named a bunch of your identities, and, and I'm going to ask you to reflect a little bit more on your identity and what it means to be Asian in America. And before I do that, I'm going to do something that um, I know is maybe a little unconventional in these spaces. We're actually going to show a quick clip from a documentary called Being Asian in America um, for all of us to watch, including you, Wayne, but for everybody who's who's here with us to um, watch and learn from. We're going to show it for about three minutes, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what we saw there. So um, I'm going to cue that up for us now, and um, we'll let them take it away. The Pew Research Center conducted the largest focus group study we've ever done on Asian Americans. We conducted 66 focus groups of 18 different Asian ethnic origins and also in 18 different languages to really understand in their own words, what does it mean to be Asian in America? Identity is multifaceted for everybody, depending on many contexts, depending on who is asking the question, depending on what stage of life that person who is sharing about their identity is at, and also it depends on where they are. For our study, we particularly interested in how people think about their racial and ethnic identity. Asians living in the United States is very broad, diverse group. You have the largest groups, um, Chinese Americans, Indian, Filipino, um, Korean and Vietnamese and Japanese Americans. But then you also have other groups that are, are smaller in terms of population size, Cambodian, Laotian, and Hmong. And you also have very different geographies. So South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. So all these different geographic origins um, make up what we all call by shorthand Asian or Asian American in the United States. The idea of identity is something that people always thought about. But in our focus groups, some of them had to spend some time to articulate that. So the challenge is not about who they are, it's about explaining to people who they are and then trying to explain it in a way for a non co ethnic person, someone who don't share their cultural heritage to understand. And that's also something we heard explicitly from some of them saying that I know who I am, but it's hard to tell them when they don't even know where my country is, geographically speaking. I think 
I straight up just identify myself as a Chinese American woman. I think it's very important to mention the fact that like where where my parents are from, where um, who I am, and then where I was born, America. At, when I came to the U.S., I was five years old, and I remember feeling confused. I remember feeling which one is my home because I was young enough that I didn't really remember my a full experience of being in Laos. Uh, but I also remember thinking I don't fit in here. And as a young child, it was just very confusing. Am I Lao? Am I American? When I was growing up, I felt definitely Chinese. And, but I felt I was Chinese American because I was born in America. But I felt that others didn't see me as being an American born Chinese. They saw me as just being Chinese. I, I would say that having lived overseas, American is, is first and foremost my identity. So there's so much more to this documentary and I would definitely encourage uh, folks to um, look it up if you're interested and curious to, um, to learn more. And what I really just wanna do, uh, Wayne, is turn it back over to you to react to what you saw there and you know maybe share a little bit on, again, sort of this idea of um, identity, even, even just like we said, the term AAPI and its imperfections was sort of touched on there. Um, so what are your reactions to what we just saw? Sure, no, I, I've seen that video a few times and I was fortunate actually uh, a week or two ago, I was on a national panel um, uh, with Neil from Pew specifically talking about his survey results and how people reacted to it. And I think we have to put a context to this where Asian Americans, specifically Chinese Americans and Filipinos have been in the United States since the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, but too often we're just seen as being immigrants or foreign born. And the term Asian American did not even come about until the 1960s, uh, inspired by the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. So if you were to ask my parents, are you Asian American? they would not identify with that term until the last couple of years. They would have thought of themselves as Chinese or Chinese American. And I think that's where there's so many layers of this identity of our ethnic identity or nationality being Chinese in my case. Uh, but then whether you're foreign born or whether you're born here, then being Chinese American uh, when you're here. And when we have a racial group that is made up of people from over 40 countries, 40 plus ethnicities, um, to uh, the, uh, the number of languages and dialects that exist, that go into the hundreds, uh, to different religious groups. Um, if you were to go to someone in, in China, they would tell you about the dozens of ethnic groups that exist in China. Well, here we think about Chinese Americans as one ethnic group. And um, nowadays, we I remember going from Asian American in the 60s to Asian American Pacific Islanders in the 90s. And then now in the last couple of years, we've included NH, Native Hawaiian. So it's ANHPI is the term we use. And we're trying to find these catch-all terms for a community that's mostly foreign born, has an immigrant history, that struggled due to this push and pull of immigration. And I think it's just very complicated uh, for people to understand how diverse of a community from those who speak English, don't speak English, those who are born here, those who are not born here. Um, I have staff in my organization who say, I'm mainlander, I'm Taiwanese. Well, I'm not indigenous Taiwanese, so I'm from Hong Kong. Uh, and these are the conversations that exist uh, amongst the community. And then we broaden it out to folks who are Indian or Bangladeshi or Korean or Hmong or BN. And it just gets really complicated about what is bringing us together. Thanks, Wayne. That's so interesting. And I um, just on the fly here, uh, hearing you talk, you know, my my family is from Puerto Rico. I'm born in New York and, and I'm realizing how many similarities there are with like the term Latinx and um, you know, really uh, the layers upon layers where you can unpack, right? Because we we use these terms to describe very large groups of people who, as you said, have um, not only different racial and ethnic identities, but different religious identities and so, so many more national origins within. Um, really, really helpful the way that you just described that and broke it down for us. Um, would like to, to give you some time here to, to share a little bit about the um, 
what I might call the persistent challenges faced by the AAPI community in New York City. You know, we're again looking back and thinking about history. So thinking about maybe how some of that historical context has shaped where we are today and what some of the challenges might be for the community. Sure. And I think um to tie this together about the needs of the community. So what's been persistent and now what's emerging to the first question about knowing the community. Um, two years ago, an organization did a survey about name famous Asians. It was a national survey that was done. And this is before uh, everywhere, whatever, all at once <laughs> and came out. And the survey was basically name an Asian celebrity or famous Asian. The number one answer was, I don't know. The second answer was Bruce Lee, which is great, but he's been dead for over 40 years. And the third one is Jackie Chan, and he's great too, except he's from Hong Kong, who happens to act in some American films in the latter half of his career. He's not quote-unquote Asian American. And I think that's where we like to talk about the two stereotypes that Asian Americans face. There's A, the model minority stereotype, which is the one that we're all successful. We go to the specialized high schools. We go to Ivy Leagues. We have the best jobs. And then the other stereotype we deal with is the perpetual foreigner. So it doesn't matter if you've been here five generations or five weeks. You're seen as this other who's not, quote unquote, American. And that's why we get the questions like, where are you from? California. Where are you really from? Or how do you speak English so well? And I think we have to unpack these because of all racial groups in New York City, and this was done by the New, uh, survey done by, uh, or study done by the New York City Center for, um, a CEO, uh, Center for uh, Employment Opportunities, um, or sorry, Economic Opportunity, actually did research and said that the Asian American community of all racial groups in New York actually have the highest rate of poverty at over 26%. Uh, Asian Americans have the highest rate of linguistic isolation, me, meaning no one over the age of 14 in the household speaks English well. Uh, it has the highest rate of overcrowded housing, which means multiple family members are in their home. And that's why it gets offset by that stat of, in the census, Asian Americans supposedly have the highest household income. That's true, because we have more people in a household who's somehow earning income, whether it's public benefits, work, or other things. So I think that's where we always push for having disaggregated data that, yes, the Asian American community, we do have a history and a solidarity together. We stand together and we're the fastest growing group in New York at 18 percent of the population, which means there's 1.6 million Asians in New York City alone. That's double the size of San Francisco. That's more than folks who live in Rhode Island. Um, <clears throat> but folks don't understand that our community has needs, and that's why we get less than 2% of social services contract dollars from the city of New York. So this is a long way to say that we are always pushing for disaggregated data because the number, the top five health needs in the Chinese community are different than the top five health needs, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Filipino community, which is different than the top five health needs in the Indian community. So if you are targeting public health messaging as h and or DOHMH, then we need to target why is it Filipinos have the highest rate of hypertension versus Chinese American women who have the highest rates of suicidal ideation. And I think that's where we always need to tease out these two stereotypes of perpetual foreigner and model minority that underlie the levels of poverty, language barriers, lack of culturally competent services that our community has historically faced. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. That's um, really, really helpful. And, and I think that term and that concept of disaggregating is, <laughs> is going to stick with me because that really makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding, right, we're not a monolith and, and there's um, different needs and assets, right, within the community. Um, and I think of you as a fierce advocate. You are, um, again, a, a somebody who runs a very large social services agency that touches a lot of different kinds of programs. So you're familiar with job training, after school programs, food pantries, the, the whole gamut. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of like a maybe magic wand moment here <laughs> to share, you know, as we think about the needs, but also as we think about solutions and, and programs and services, um, what are kind of the issue areas or the service areas where the AAPI community could maybe most benefit or um, where you see the investments um, having the maximum impact? Sure. Thank you for this opportunity. So 
Um, what we always like to remind everyone is that the Asian American community, because COVID was seen so much as a racialized uh, pandemic at the beginning, perpetuated by our former, our former president, that it was really at the end of December 2019 or the beginning of January 2020, where Asian American neighborhoods were actually hit before New York went on pause at the end of May 2020. So that means for two to two and a half months, Asian American neighborhoods saw a drop in business. In Chinatown alone, there was 50 to 80 percent business drops. Um, that also to remind folks that the Asian American community out of all New York City residents had the highest rate of unemployment during the pandemic at about 7,000 percent. Based on survey data done by health and hospitals, um, Chinese Americans followed by Indian Americans actually had the highest mortality rate of COVID um, in 2020. So I say all this to be clear, like I'm not here for oppression Olympics and that Asians are more oppressed than Black and African American communities or more oppressed than Latin, Latinx communities. But what I am saying is that there needs to be a fair share of resources for these communities and let's invest in the services that work to be culturally competent and language accessible. I, folks always ask me, when did people, Chinese folks, stop leaving Chinatown and move to East Harlem and move to Flushing and move to Sunset Park? Just imagine you come to a country where things aren't translated and you don't speak English. How do you find affordable housing? Jump on the purple line, go to the end, get off, and you could find housing. That's how Flushing came around 40, 30 years ago. When uh, jump on the yellow line, cross over into Brooklyn, the moment you see sunlight, get out. That's how 8th Avenue and Sunset Park became another Chinatown. We saw that about 10, 15 years ago with East Harlem, jump on the green line, go up before you cross the river, get out, there's affordable housing. Why these lines? Because you can still do your main businesses in Chinatown and Lower East Side. I share all this to say that I think Asian Americans, like all New Yorkers, we want the same thing. Good schools, good jobs, to be housed, to be healthy, to age in place, to have safe neighborhoods where we live, eat, sleep, worship, and study. Um, but I think that's where it's always important to remind folks about how COVID exacerbated the issues of housing, exacerbated the issues of lack of health insurance and culturally competent care, how it exacerbated issues of mental health that have so much, so many stigmas in the diverse Asian American community. So if I had a magic wand in no particular order, it would be one that we do need the city of New York, as well as the state and the feds, to fund their fair share of linguistically appropriate, culturally competent services in the AAPI community. Again, we're the fastest growing racial group, 18% of New York City, 10% of New York State, but we get less than 2% of social services contract dollars. Um, and honestly, if you took CPC out of the equation, that percentage would drop more. So we need to see more investments. And as you all know, we need to fully fund these services. We need to pay for full indirect of these services. And we need to pay our workers well. And that's why let's pay a living wage for our workers who come from the communities, who grew up in the neighborhoods. Many of my staff, they came to our after school programs. They come to our summer youth employment programs. And now they're leaders at CPC. Um, and then last but not least, we just need to make sure that while we're fully funding services and we're investing in living wages and better benefits for our staff and our workers, we need to make sure that there's more leadership to bring diverse communities together. Everyone talks about uh, the rise of anti-Asian hate, which is true. According to national statistics by the group Stop AAPI Hate, 80% of the perpetrators of hate against Asian Americans in the United States are white. However, when you look at news stories about API hate incidents, 80% of the perpetrators are Black. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that TV news and media keeps perpetuating that to other people of color that are attacking the API community? So that's why I just want to remind everyone that we need to make sure we lead with our values and we provide more opportunities to bring Black, Brown, and Asian community members together. Yeah, that's fascinating. I've never heard those statistics before, and um, unfortunately, not surprising, but um, but a great point. And you've set us up um, really well for this last question that I have for you before we um, actually send our participants here into some groups to talk through this a little bit more. But I'm going to first ask you, 
you know, what kind of guidance or advice you would give for folks who maybe want to be better allies to the AAPI community? And you've already sort of started to name some things there, but I'll, I'll let you answer that question and then we're going to give folks some time to talk about it together. Sure. I mean, my first suggestion is uh, get to know and learn the community. I think I take it upon myself that I'm going to learn about other communities. For example, when I started learning about the Garifuna community moving into New York City or learning about the plight of asylum seekers, just spending the time to learn about the community and recognizing the AAPI community is very diverse, but just learning about that. Secondly, is I think it's good to have safe spaces where we can learn and celebrate different cultures, whether it's Lunar New Year, whether it's AAPI Heritage Month. But let's go beyond what I like to call chomp and stomp, which is let's eat and let's dance. That's great for celebrations. I love me a good lion dance. I love seeing performances and eating lots of food. But while that does bring communities together, diverse communities together, let's go beyond chomp and stomp and really figure out ways of doing things like this, where we talk about the literature, let's talk about the history, let's talk about the successes and accomplishments of AAPI folks in the United States. And I would say last but not least is during this time of the rise of anti-Asian hate, if there's a silver lining, there is more attention to what is of the challenges persistent and emerging in the AAPI community. And let's use that as an opportunity once again to build more ties together and really challenge what's existed. Um, so what I mean by that is, um, I know it's complicated when we talk about police and police do play a role in community safety, but they're not the only solutions even amongst the AAPI community. So I think that's where we need to make sure that any solutions we have to support the AAPI community, especially in addressing hate incidents, do not have, cause us to roll back other reforms that we've made that are helpful for other communities of color. All right. I usually call it food and flags, but I think chomp and stomp is going to be my new go-to um, saying there. Um, thank you for those insights and really for helping to get um, us all thinking about sort of the parts that we can play. So for everyone here, this is the, the part where you're going to get involved in just a moment. We're going to send you into some breakout groups that you can have a chat with each other. And I will um, share some discussion questions and prompts on the screen as you're in those groups, but just so you know what's coming. Obviously, we, we invite you to um, introduce yourselves and maybe what uh, inspired you to come to today's session. Um, we suggest that you maybe talk through some of the unique um, strengths and challenges that we've talked about, about the AAPI community that have come up today. Um, and then really talk about this idea of allyship. So an ally is someone who helps and supports other people who are part of a group that is treated unfairly, although they are not themselves a member of that group. So really getting you, to, you all to think, you know, based on that kind of textbook definition of what an ally is, um, how you might be able to enter into more of an, of an ally role. Um, and then think about your next steps in doing that, right? So that we, we're not just talking about it today, but we're really thinking about what we're going to do next. So I am going to open up these breakout rooms for about about 10 minutes or so on the clock. Um, I invite you all to go ahead and have a conversation. I'll share the discussion questions on the screen, and then we'll invite you back for some final wrap-up and Q&A with Wayne and myself. Thanks. 